This is a warning for anyone who may want to attempt a platter swap on their own. Do not attempt this if you have critical, irreplaceable data. If you have family photos, if you have business files that cannot be replaced, please do not attempt this. Also, the chances of success are very slim. Even with our knowledge with hard drives and working on them for over 10 years now, the chances of doing this and making it work were still extremely slim. If you have data that must be recovered, please call a professional. It doesn't even have to be our company. Just call anybody. Call Drive Savers, OnTrack, CBL. There's a number of companies out there that can help you. Just do some research and find a reputable company. Finally, if the platters become loose or misaligned, your data is gone and there's nothing that anybody can do to help you after that. For more information about our services, you can call 1-800-717-8974 or visit our website at acsdata.com. Thanks for watching, and again, just keep in mind, this is a demonstration, but there are real consequences if you actually have data that you can't replace and it ends up being gone for good because of a mistake. Okay, this video is going to be completely different than anything we've done in the past. We are going to show you step by step how you could actually go through and recover a hard drive with a damaged spindle motor yourself just using really very simple tools. It should be stated initially that A, I don't want to do this video for a myriad of reasons which have nothing to do with business whatsoever. Um, you know, we know that we're going to get the customers that we get, and we're not going to get the customers that we don't get. I mean, it's not anything that we lose sleep over. You know, our business is going to be here to stay for many years to come. However, the thing that I do fret about doing this is the fact that I don't want people who have irreplaceable data to try this on their own. I cannot state that enough. Do not try this on your own because what we're going to be doing is going to be extremely unorthodox in a lot of ways. It's going to be in a way very potentially harmful to the hard drive itself and the ability to get the data off of it later if for some reason your attempt doesn't work. And I don't want to lose sleep at night knowing that somebody tried this who had 10 years of family pictures on there and lost it. So it's really something I'm very conflicted about uh, doing and um, I just cannot stand the thought of people trying this with data that they can't get back and that they have to have. This is strictly for let's say you lost your iTunes library or um, just some old documents that you don't really care if you get them back or not, you know, but you definitely don't want to spend, you know, hundreds of dollars or, you know, thousand dollars or whatever on data recovery. This is for you and for you alone. Um, I don't want people to take this and then go through and say they can open up a data recovery business because they followed the steps in this either um, and then start mangling people's hard drives. Um, you have to bear in mind that when you go in and you start working on people's you know, drives that have failed, you essentially hold a lot of their life in your hands. Um, you know, it can be their entire business, it can be uh, a memories of a lifetime. So, you know, I, there's nothing that frustrates me worse than seeing, you know, having people contact us and say, oh, well, I did this, or I saw this in another video, and, you know, and I tried this. You know, part of this video is kind of as a warning because it may not work what we're trying to do. Um, so, you know, part of it is kind of a warning that, hey, this is extremely risky what we're going to do and just trying to give you a heads up. And part of it is also to kind of be somewhat instructional if it's something that, like I said, you just want to give it a shot. Now, this is a Seagate Barracuda 7200.10 hard drive. It's a 750 gig drive. And let me show you what it's doing. I'm just going to hook it up to a little USB SATA adapter. You won't even have to, you'll be able to hear it.
hear that? That buzzing sound is actually the spindle motor trying to spin, but it can't because it's actually not locked up, which we thought it was. This is just a parts drive that came in, and I opened it because sometimes we'll go ahead and use some of the parts out of these. Um, but when I opened it, I noticed that the, the actual uh, spindle still rotated without any problems. So the spindle is not the problem. We did some voltage tests on the back, and actually you come to find out it's in the motor itself, which is really weird for these drives. Seagate hard drives are very well known for having spindle seizures and things like that. The tools that we use for those types of recoveries are extremely expensive and some of what we've invested do, to do them on our own, um, you know, we literally have, you know, thousands of dollars invested into one piece of equipment that allows us to do these very proficiently. Um, any version of a Seagate hard drive uh, and it especially allows us to easily, not easily, but more efficiently go through and swap out bearings themselves because in most cases with these drives, it's actually the bearing that goes out on the, and the spindle shaft and it'll just get in there and warp a little bit and then the whole thing is seized up. So we actually have some equipment here that allows us to punch out that bearing and replace it. Um, we actually have another piece of equipment that allows us to go through and swap the platters if we need to on some of these um, without having to worry about the spacers, which you'll see later on. There's spacers that go between each platter surface and in, in here that you have to work around. So i um, just going to go through and show you, really, I'm not even going to cut the tape. I'm going to push record on it when we start recording. I'm going to show you a little bit here initially that uh, you might need as far as getting some components together and just some what little bit of tools you need and just some of the little pieces of plastic and stuff like that that we think will work. Um, some of this is kind of off of stuff that we've seen on the web that people have tried um, and in theory it seems like it should work and I think sometimes a lot of times the people that have it not work they just either have you know, just careless with it, you know, the bad parts, you know, things like that. Um, it's really less to do with having a clean room and more to do with having the experience, the knowledge, the tools, and uh, and then, you know, being able to image the drive afterwards uh, to get these done and get them done successfully. So, without further ado, I am reluctantly starting this video project and I hope it's something that you um, enjoy. I'm hoping that it helps people that can't, like I said, afford you know data recovery or have no intention of spending money to get their data recovered and I hope that it maybe will spell out why um, it's important that you do seek out professional data recovery from a company whether it's ours or Drive Savers or On Track or CBL or DTI or any of the uh, the companies that are out there. There's a handful of them that are very proficient with what they do, just like we are. And I have no problems recommending competitors to to people if um, if for some reason they're not comfortable working with us. And uh, you know we want to see you get your data back more than anything else. That's all we focus on. That's the only thing we care about. So. We'll go ahead and get started. First thing I'm going to do is uh, show you what you're going to need to be able to go through and get the heads to actually uh, stay separated once you offload them. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is show you um, a way that probably will work to um, lift the heads. I put it on a set of heads actually uh, earlier, and it's a little, well, it's a lot different than. Um, what we utilize, but it may work in a pinch, and um, in theory, it seems like it should work just fine. Um, it's gonna shoot like a blister pack off of, um, I don't know, like a package, some sort of packaged material. You know, the blister pack, the little plastic see-through area, like what you would see over the top of like an action figure or something like that. Um, cut your strip off of that, and. Go through and snip this lengthwise. Okay, so we've cut that down a bit. 
doesn't really need to be this long. We'll go through and trim it back a little bit. Then what you want to do is take this smaller piece that you have now, pinch it off right so that it bends right in the middle there, just like that. So it has, you need something that's got some spring to it. So see how we I let off of that and it springs open? That's going to hold the heads apart. So depending on how many heads you have, we'll determine how many of these you need. Now, this is for a Seagate drive that we're working on, obviously. Um, but now if you're working with a Western Digital Drive or anything like that, don't even uh, attempt to just remove the heads um, just freely without doing anything more to them. Uh, those drives actually have the head alignment controlled by the, uh, the initial head alignment anyway set by the, um, the case cover. So removing the heads, even removing the case cover itself can throw off the uh, the alignment to where it'll be almost impossible to regain it without having the equipment to do it. So, But for our purposes here, for demonstration anyway, you know, this will probably suffice. So we'll go through and, and move to the next phase of this and uh, and see how this works. Okay, here we go with what you're going to need pair of powder-free surgical gloves to keep fingerprints off the platter surface, a T8 Torx driver, uh, a set of tweezers, and it's nice if you have them where they have kind of a pointy end to where it's you know, grab onto smaller parts. Um, then these are the things that we made uh, in the last part of our video. The, uh, the lifts for the heads, so we made a few of these to kind of keep the heads from contacting each other. And finally, we're going to need some shipping tape. I'll explain that more once we get to that point, but uh, definitely want to have something that's um, something like shipping tape, and preferably make sure it is shipping tape. Um, the only reason I say that, even though we haven't tried this before, I know by the material on the platters themselves, there's no way that you're going to get anything else that's probably going to stick as good as this without leaving a residue. So, um, And last but not least, you're going to need another drive case with a good spindle motor. And already disassembled, so we just took an old one and then just completely disassembled it. So, that's it. Okay, I decided to go ahead and use a uh, separate microphone for this and just do the uh, voiceover uh, as the video plays as opposed to trying to talk over our clean room environment because uh, there's so much noise from the air circulating around in there it's almost impossible to hear anything. So, And I know we've had some complaints about that in the past, uh, just some videos that uh, we have out there and I know it's hard to hear sometimes what we're saying so I want to make sure we're crystal clear here going to go ahead and start by removing the uh, PCB and again this is uh, extremely informal uh, just actually uh, shot this video uh, one evening after our normal business hours just here late working on some some other jobs and had a little bit of time and decided to do this so the PCB is uh, has been removed and um, again this is not something you want to do if you have data that you absolutely have to have. If you have critical data, irreplaceable data, do not do this at all. I'm um, going to go ahead and start removing the case cover. And again, this is a Seagate 750GB 7200.10 hard drive. This process will not work on 7200.11s or .12s or very many other Seagate drives for that matter. Uh, we actually have special equipment for those and that's what would be necessary for other uh, types of drives, the more modern ones, but um, you can kind of get away with this, I believe, uh, fairly easily uh, on some of the 7200.10s.
but uh, that's only if, like I've said a million times, if you have data that you don't really care if you lose or not. Okay, just going to go ahead and pry up the case cover. And we have the head assembly, everything's intact. Actually, there's nothing wrong with the spindle motor, the bearing itself. The spindle actually seizes, isn't, I'm sorry, the spindle itself is not seized. It's the motor that has the problem. Uh, it's very rare that that's the case. Right now, I'm just going through and removing uh, the um, the two screws that hold the interface for the the head stack assembly. It's the area that actually connects to the uh, PCB and relays the data back and forth. All of these screws inside here are actually um, T8 Torx screws as well. And now I'm just gonna pop the uh, magnet off. Some of these magnets are pretty strong so it gets to where you have a way of doing it. We don't usually do it now with this just with the screwdriver prying it off. It can be done and some of them we go ahead and do that with because they're not that difficult but some of the tighter ones like this we actually have a separate device that we use. Uh, so we just make sure we don't do any damage to the drive. Again we try to make this as much um, about doing this process with normal everyday tools that you might be able to get a hand, you know, hold of fairly easily. Now what I'm doing here is actually spinning the platters slightly as I move the heads off. Now you want to make sure that you spin the platters in the same uh, direction that the end of it is pointing. So in this case we want to spin them uh, counterclockwise. Now what I'm going to do is actually load the, um, and I'm just using a set of little pointy end tweezers to squeeze the, uh, the little head spring that we've created out of that blister pack in the uh, previous section. So I'm taking that, one of those pieces of plastic that I made and uh, squeezing them together, inserting them between the heads and then releasing it. And now what I'm going to do is take that and I'm going to gently slide it up to where I'm almost to the end of the head stack. And this is pretty tricky too because you want to make sure that you don't do anything to uh, sever any of the um, electrical connections there and you don't want it to slide too far and actually uh, go too far and actually hit the, the head itself and damage the head. Again this is kind of learning as I go I guess in a way with, uh, with using this because we have a tool that actually affixes itself to the actual center point on the head stack and screws down on there and we don't have to rotate the platters and move the heads out the way we're doing right now we can actually slide that device in underneath the heads and it lifts them and then we slide it out and it makes for a lot cleaner uh, and it definitely reduces the chance that you're going to go through and do any damage to the platters or the heads trying to to get them off here so I'm repeating the process for uh, the other heads that we uh, that we have. Each one of those, I'm just I work from the bottom going towards the top, and again just squeezing them together with the tweezers, get them to where I just have them underneath the uh, kind of towards the base of the head stack, and then sliding them forward. And what that does is it creates a little bit of tension on the end of that head and will make it to where when you finally want to go through and move it off of the platter surface, um, they'll kind of spring up. It's very tricky, very risky really with the heads to be honest with you because you can have it in situations like this where the head is still technically touching the platter um, and those surfaces on the, uh, the head slider, which is the end of the, the head stack there that you actually can see pretty easily with the naked eye, a little black square, it's called a slider. Um, that actually bonds to the surface of the platter itself. So it really, this is not the way to do things, but 
for the sake of just doing kind of an experiment and showing you that you know which what is prob probable anyway you know things you can do so what I've done is just moved the head stack again and I'm kind of trying to show you there the heads are moved off of the platters and those little pieces of plastic that we made and bent are actually holding the heads apart so that they don't come in contact with one another now I'm just taking a flathead screwdriver and turning the um, the main screw that holds the the head stack assembly to the drive chassis there's parts of this process that are actually making me almost cringe but um, we take what we do very seriously and I don't like to halfway do it so this is kinda hard for me anyway showing you here that the uh, the heads are separated and what we have there is actually working uh, to keep them apart now we're going to go ahead and remove the lower magnet there are actually two magnets inside inside the drive there's an upper magnet and a lower magnet and basically the way the hard drive works it creates an electromagnetic field which helps the actuator function in the most simplest terms that's how it works you have uh, copper coiled wire around that actuator which is the at the end of the uh, the head stack and you need the magnetic field to help that function so we have the magnets removed we have the heads removed pretty much just have the, the platters left in there now and like I said there's nothing wrong with the spindle uh, bearing in this like you normally would see in a, a CA drive it's actually just the motor the electric motor so here's my shipping tape and this was um, something I read about and saw somebody else say that they tried it and I was like that sounds ridiculous but for the sake of argument and just in the spirit of making this kind of a an experiment on a uh, do-it-yourself type level I figured we would go ahead and try this so basically what I did was just cut off a piece of uh, the shipping tape and now I'm just pressing it along all of the edge of the platter surface there and I try to make it as wide as I could to, to cover as much of the platter as you can you do not want the platter alignment to shift in any way shape or form uh, having that platter shift in alignment is a sure way uh, that the data won't be recoverable and there's absolutely no tolerance there so if one of your platters gets out of whack you know out of alignment even in just on on a scale of even microns um, there's no way the data is going to be recoverable now there's ways that you can go through manually if you have the equipment to be able to get the data or get the platters somewhat realigned after a lot of work but um, now this piece of plastic here that I just cut off is really going to try to help me get um, this the tape down in between uh, the drive chassis and the platter surface on this far side there's actually uh, spacers between each of these platters and Seagate is really bad about having them that's why this only works on this version because the 7200.11s and .12s the, the spacers uh, take up too much space well, too much there's no gap hardly at all for tape to even fit down inside between the the platter and the chassis so what I'm doing is going to take the uh, tape here and I'm going to insert it in two different areas along the platter surface where I just pulled out that air filter you may have noticed a little white piece that I pulled out I'm gonna put a piece of tape down in that gap and then just on the other side of that I'm gonna put another piece of tape I'm trying to get as much of a contact point as I can get so I'm trying to show you there that that's where I'm gonna put that piece of tape at Now 
I'm just going to take that piece of plastic I had and just kind of push it down in there and it's just kind of pressing the tape up against the platter to help it adhere to the uh, to the edge of the platter surface. At this point I'm still not entirely sure this is all going to work at all. Um, my fear is is that whenever I go through and actually move the platters that they're just going to drop out because of the the tape not holding. Like I said, the equipment that we use, we actually have a special device that actually grips the platter in, in segments, um, and they're, we have two different devices that are actually manufactured for each of these types of hard drives, and they have different fittings for them. Uh, a lot of times, too, with damaged spindle bearings, which is what we normally see as opposed to this being the motor, um, we would actually use another device that we have to press the bearing out and then install a new bearing. So right now I'm uh, going to go through and get another piece of tape and try to do this other uh, gap that is on the other side of where the the filter was. And it's a little tighter fit but done. Uh, still though the, the tape itself goes in pretty easily. So I'm trying to get that to slide down in there, which it does. And then I just go through and visually make sure that it goes all the way to the bottom and, and is touching the edge of all four platters, uh, you know, securely at least, so that if there's a, it, it fully covers the edge of the platter surface. You don't want it to, to go through and only adhere, you know, really well to the top three platters and then leave that, that bottom platter unsecured. So basically I just took that piece of plastic again and uh, and just pushed down, pushed, kind of used it to push against the edge of the tape to adhere to it. And then I just touched up the, the other side that was there in the open. So now I'm starting to go through and actually um, unscrew, take the screws out of the, uh, the, the spacers that are between the platters. They're a little bit longer screw. Again, all these are just uh, T8 Torx uh, screws. And one final time, if, uh, if you're thinking about doing this, please don't do it if you have data that you have to have. I am horrified of people doing this and they have, you know, a decade's worth of family pictures or something like that on there. That's the uh, one thing I've reiterated a million times on this is my biggest problem is people doing this that have things that they can't replace or computer repair shops taking you know a video like this or computer tech you know taking a video like this and thinking you know they're just going to do this with everybody's drive because it most likely won't work um, in most cases but uh, the risk is tremendous if it's done wrong especially if the data is irreplaceable so I hate to harp on that, and I hate to keep bringing that up, but that's just um, it's a big, big thing for us. So I'm going to go ahead now and uh, remove that hub with the screws. Now everything is loose. I'll bring the other drive uh, chassis over that, um, that has the good spindle motor in it. And this is the big move right here, and that's getting this pack of platters and the spacers move from one drive chassis to the next. If this part fails, then it's over. It doesn't matter. So, moving it over actually went fairly smooth. We'll drop it down inside this groove that has that's there for the spacers and everything, but the move itself actually was much easier than I anticipated. At this point, I go straight back into securing um, the platters to the hub again.
right now I'm just going to start putting the screws uh, into the hub itself. I'm not going to tighten them down at all. I'm just kind of setting their placement and setting the alignment of the hub itself. Because one thing you want to do on this is you kind of want to torque the screws down in stages and you want to do them in a pattern um, somewhat like a I guess a star pattern uh, to where you go let's say top to bottom and then maybe to the side and then to the X the next side and then back to the top and then the bottom so you kinda want to rotate um, the pattern in which you're tightening down you don't want to just tighten it completely down on one side and then work your way around because you're gonna throw off the alignment on the hub it's gonna be warped a little bit and it doesn't take much so so right now I'm just going through and just setting them in place, not tightening them. I'm going to take one here and I'm just going to start snugging it just to where I can start to feel it become tight. And then I'm going to go to the one across, which is what I just did. And then I'm going to go back to the one across and then down to the one across from that. Again, not tightening, just snugging them until I can just feel them start to get uh, a little bit of torque on them and back up to the top. I'm going to repeat that process and now I'm going to take about a quarter turn and that's going to tighten them down enough. You don't want to over tighten them either. Now I want to double check them. Now I can put the screws back in for the spacers. Once those are back in place, you can start taking the tape off because everything is secured at this point. This tape here on this side was actually pretty well secured and it was um, actually tough to get one of those pieces off. Like I said, whenever I wanted to make sure that it had adhered to all four platter uh, surfaces so that you know one of the platters didn't drop out. Go ahead and put the filter back in. And right there I'm just kind of looking at the platter surface and the reflection of the lights that we have and just making sure there's no real wobbles or you know, it doesn't have uh, any type of oscillation in it whenever it's rotating. Right now I'm just reinstalling the bottom magnet and the two screws that go with that. There's a small black lever there that the heads actually uh, click against, and I'm just making I just made sure that that was back in its reset position. Now I'm going to go through and install the heads, and there's a a screw that it that is built into the heads actually. So I'm just going through and making sure it aligns with the hole in the chassis. And like I said, this is quite a bit different than how we usually do it but it seems to work okay. Just 
just making sure those are snugging down there, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and tighten it off. So the head is secured. Now I'm going to load them back onto the platters. I have those pieces of plastic in there still. I never remove them because obviously you don't want the heads touching, so they're still separated and they slide right back onto the uh, platter surface without touching the platter. Now very carefully I'll go through and slide them back a little bit and then out. And when you do this the head will actually uh, come in contact with the platter again So it keeps the head stack from slipping off of the edge of the platter as well. Now very carefully I need to rotate the platters and put the head assembly back to its parked position. You kind of want to do this in one move, which there it goes. It just clicked into place. Now I can screw down the, uh, the interface to the controller board from the heads. And at this point, um, the most difficult part of the process is over. Go ahead and refix the uh, the magnet. I'm just using a screwdriver there so I can get my finger out of the way because those are pretty strong. And then I can let down on it with the uh, with the magnet itself. There's one screw that goes in uh, where the magnet uh, is. And um, so that drive is now reassembled. Platters have been moved over, heads have been replaced. Uh, we're using the original set of heads. There's shouldn't be anything wrong with them. The drive wasn't dropped or anything. It was just a some sort of electrical issue. It seems. I mean, I'll put you this way: the heads hadn't been used before, but. When we got it in as a parts drive, um, and we noticed it had this problem, we ran some tests and the heads themselves actually checked out okay uh, as far as voltage readings and things like that, so they should be uh, okay. I kind of went into this thinking, after I'd put this all back together, wow, I hope these heads are still good, because otherwise this could all bend for nothing. <laughs> but um, now we're just going through and um, I'm putting the screws back into the case cover. So we've gone through pretty much non-stop, start to finish, the entire process. Um, after this, I'm going to go through and just uh, connect the controller board again, and um, we should be good to go to test it out. Okay, so we have our hard drive connected to uh, one of our imaging stations. Um, this is a deep spar disk imager that we use. Um, we have our destination drive here, which is just a one terabyte um, hard drive. So uh, you'll recall this is a 750 gig drive that was uh, the one that had the issue. Um, basically, our imagers, which is what we have throughout, um, are what clone the hard drive sector by sector from this drive to this drive. So when you do a mechanical repair on a drive, um, even under ideal conditions, usually you're going to have some degradation in performance. So it's good to go through and clone it. For one thing, um, the biggest thing is the fact that you're dealing with a copy of the customer's data when you go to recover as opposed to just working directly from the source. That way uh, if we do something or want to try different things we don't have to worry about it uh, you know going through and doing anything to um, 
harm the integrity of the source data. So uh, we go through and we work with DeepSpark imagers mainly because they are extremely flexible in what they allow the hard drive to do. If you were to connect most hard drives that we go through and repair, if you were to connect them directly to a PC, they might recognize and you might get them to image some um, with whatever cloning software is out there, but chances are when they hit areas that are hard to read, um, you're going to run into serious issues that it's not going to be able to handle. And basically with our deep spar imagers, um, it's just a system that we build strictly for these. Uh, you have the controller card here. Uh, this is the primary controller card, so you can see um, the IDE ribbon cable coming off here, and then the SATA cable here, and its own power supply, or you know, power connector there. This auxiliary uh, board here um, is just an option that we got uh, on our imagers for handling uh, USB drives. Now we get a lot of question on this, a lot of questions on these uh, imagers that we use. And no, there are no uh, demos that DeepSpar puts out. At least I'm not aware of any, and I can't imagine that they would. And uh, you might be able to go on and, and see how the software works. Um, but there's no demos, and roughly the cost is about uh, four thousand to maybe forty five hundred dollars per system. So anyway, um, with that, we'll go through and show you kind of what the interface looks like and you may have seen it on some other um, videos that we have. We have our source drive showing here and basically what we'll need to do is go through, like I said, the, the drive itself has no power applied to it and to do that, to apply power to it, we just go here and hit the F11 key and I'll hold the uh, camera down close so you can kind of listen in closely to see if the drive even uh, calibrates. It may not do anything. Starting to... No, it's chirping, so... Well, it stopped. Well, actually it did show that it's ready. Surprisingly enough, this is what we're looking for on here. These two indicators here are essentially telling us that the drive is ready. Which, given... Um, kind of the informal way that we did this procedure with just some tape and not really taking into consideration any of the normal precautions we do um, is really quite surprising. Let's see if the drive recognizes. Yep. So here's our drive uh, here, which should be once it's done, yeah, labeled as source. So our source drive is detected uh, and the proper uh, number of sectors is there. So surprisingly enough, um, it appears that this may have actually worked. And, you know, theoretically, yeah, it could work and it should work because I don't believe even with what we did there that it was sloppy enough to really um, do anything to alter the alignment of the platters too much. But still, this is something that I cannot stress enough in this video. Uh, what we just demonstrated is not... I repeat, not what you should do if you have data that is absolutely critical, um, data that's irreplaceable. Um, never, ever, ever attempt to do what we just did if you have data that you absolutely have to have. This demonstration is more along the lines to show that if you have data you would like to have, but it's no big deal if you can't get it back, then by all means, yeah, try whatever options you might have out there. Um, the likelihood of success is extraordinarily slim, um, but, you know, it's worth a shot. And uh, if, again, if it's data that you just would like to have but don't necessarily have to have back. Um, if it's data that you just cannot live without and you must have it, do not do this at all. Uh, just give us a call. Um, you can call any data recovery company. It doesn't even have to be us. Call DTI, call Drive Savers, call CBL, call OnTrack. You know, any of the reputable companies out there will be able to help you. If you decide you don't want to work with us for some reason, that's fine. But get professional data recovery service. Even if the pricing is something that's holding you back, um, put the drive up in a closet somewhere, wrap it up in some bubble wrap or something like that, and just 
save up the money uh, until you can afford it or give us a call and a lot of times what we'll do is we'll work out um, payment plans even for some of our customers where we split it up into three or four payments so there's options that are out there that would be much greater than trying to do it on your own so I'll go ahead and hit OK and we'll see if this drive even images getting it to recognize is one thing getting it to image is something else so I'll go through and change some of these parameters here uh, that we normally do for some of the drives when we're imaging them. Uh, these are just the settings for different passes that the drive makes. So what will happen is um, it'll go through and make one pass and read whatever sectors it can extremely easily and then it'll go through and uh, make a secondary pass to clean up the areas of the drive that it skipped on the first pass and a third pass doing the same thing and so on. It just makes it to where you don't have to stress the drive out trying to get as much data as you can written to it or cloned from it. So I'm not going to go through and generate a bitmap or anything right now. I'm just going to start this and see if it even images since this is just kind of a test. So it'll initialize the LBA map there and then from there, here in a few seconds, it actually should start, based on what I've seen anyway, it should start trying to image. Or maybe not. I can hear it trying to. That's why I said these things can be really sketchy when you um, do the process the way we did it with it just kind of, like I said, swapping platters with tape is something that I'd heard somebody talk about on a message board one time and I couldn't even fathom that it would even work and it was something where I thought, well, it's worth at least showing the good or the bad. You know, either it can work or it might not work, but it's worth, you know, at least kind of throwing out there. It's having a real hard time imaging here initially. Oh, I saw a little flash of green there, so. Okay, well, it's trying to do something there. The green is good. The yellow boxes that you get there are sectors that couldn't be read. It'll, if it can't read a sector, it'll go through and actually skip the next 120. So you can see it actually here starting to image. We're about a quarter million sectors in, 400,000. Getting some data off of it. So if this was a customer's drive, this would be extremely good news right here. We would actually go through and start. Um, we would just let this run. sectors right now, which is, seems like a lot, but we're dealing with over a billion, um, and just kind of how it's sluggish, you can see right there, it's pausing and just kind of going along. It's going to take this drop and we're leave it running at least a few days to image. So, I mean, really when it comes down to the data recovery and the costs associated with it, that's what you're getting, is you're getting the ability for a company to be able to do it, instead of trying to do it yourself and not having the equipment to do it or having the best you know, thousands of dollars to even have a chance of being able to do it, um, you, know, you end up paying a little bit more, quite a bit more actually for the recovery itself by having somebody else do it, but the likelihood of it being recoverable is much greater as well. So we get a lot of, I'd say not black, but we get questions about why does data recovery cost so much and only, you know, it looks like it took you guys a little bit. So we do a recovery. It's not so much that, it's then getting to this point where you actually get the drive image. A lot of times too with situations like this, you can see how many unreadable sectors we're getting. I can almost guarantee you we're probably going to go through a set of heads on this, so we're probably going to have to go through and swap out another um, set of heads and maybe three sets of heads. So some drives we've gone through and covered where we've gone through eight or ten sets of heads to get a complete image of the data that we needed. So it's being able to do it, um, being able to do it efficiently, and having the equipment No different than if you were to go to a doctor that wants to do heart bypass surgery. It's one of those really want to go for the cheapest uh, solution. You want to make sure you're going with somebody that can actually help you and, and, and not make the situation worse. So, um, 
but anyway, we just wanted to highlight that, yeah, it looks like this can be done. Um, you know, so we're getting some that are, that's having a hard time reading, but this would be no big deal. We would just work around this in a real case. Um, and actually, I'll stop it here and try to start from maybe a few million sectors in, which is what we would do and see if it clears it up some. Um, but more than anything, we just wanted to show you that, yes, it is something that you might be able to do. Yeah, that's a lot better. And it may work for you and it may not and like I said if it's data that you absolutely have to have do not try this don't even think about trying it but if it's data that you know you might you know not care if you have it or not then by all means do whatever you can on your own and on these particular cases here this drive here that we just did this is a 7200.10 um, this solution won't work on 7200.11s or .12s just the clearances are too tight for you to be able to do anything uh, like that with tape or anything like that if a spindle motor sees. So anyway, uh, thanks for watching and we appreciate it. Subscribe to us if you haven't already. We'll be posting uh, other videos as well. Um, you, know, you can visit our website at acsdata.com to find out more about us. If you have questions about your own uh, particular case, feel free to give us a call 1-800-717-8974. Thanks again for watching.